I um, was really pleased about our first presenter uh, was able to come and uh, join us. Um, I've been learning things about the National Library of Medicine that I, that I didn't know and, and some of the really tremendous work um, that um, they're doing. Um, they are, I guess what I describe as organizing knowledge. And um, uh, Patty Brennan is, is the director of the, uh, of the library and um, I've asked her to come and talk a little bit about the library and the spectacular work. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, if you're not using it enough, if you're not integrated into what you're doing, then hopefully after this conversation you will. So let me introduce you to uh, Patty Brennan, who's director of the National Library of Medicine. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the opportunity to talk to a new community about the National Library of Medicine and its resources is a tremendous honor. I'm going to spend about 12 or 14 minutes talking with you and hopefully inspiring you to join with us as we try to build the information substrate for health and research in the future. And there's a homework assignment at the end of this talk, so get ready. Um, if I can start with my first slide, please. Um, I was inspired by the title of this meeting to move from disparities to sustainable communities and I'm here to talk to you about how the National Library of Medicine can participate in this as we are today and could in the future after we hear your goals and what you need us to prepare for <coughs> you. Now the National Library of Medicine is quite old. Um, we began in, uh, excuse me, in, in the 1800s, 1836, at, from a shelf of textbooks in a field hospital to now a worldwide network of information. I think of the library not as a static repository, but as the dynamic interplay of medicine and information constantly changing and yet always persisting. So you'll hear about some of our work that we do to preserve knowledge as well as to disseminate knowledge. And let me ask you to watch this short video with us. introduced you to our national network of libraries of medicine, which are regional libraries around the country and 6,500 points of presence in almost every community in this, in this country where we bring health information to people. It also introduced you to dbGaP, our genome database that has over 100,000 human gene sequences in it. We have a library that's largely driven by text and literature. And so I'll summarize our resources here as the National Center for Bio Biotechnology Information. And if you look down this graph, you see we have the literature, we have molecular and clinical data, and then we have specialized data sets. In this environment, which is both has research-driven service and service-inspired research, we aim to serve and we serve over four million people a day who come to the National Library of Medicine looking at PubMed, trying to find information, gathering information from our full text database, PubMed Central, which is full text articles, as well as books. 
when you go down one step to our molecular and clinical data sets, this is a little bit more specialized. Here we have the tools for analyzing genes. We have the BLAST algorithm. We have our clinical trials resource that identifies clinical trials that are active and helps engage and recruit people into clinical trials. That reaches about 300,000 people a day. And then our highly specialized data sets, our SNPs and our uh, clinical variant data sets, these re reach about 15,000 people a day. So overall, we're reaching many, many people every day from deep scientists to public health nurses to your grandmother at home. But we're best known and we're most, we're most recognized for our collections. And our collections, if you look at this circle, are describe, are, excuse me, include 17,000 serials. But if you look at the right-hand circle, PubMed, that's the place where people know us the most. When they come to search the literature, it has 25 million records. They are records of citations. Some link to actual full-text articles, some don't. Within the PubMed data set, we have something referred to as Medline. This is a highly curated set of, our, of journals. We have a public federal authority uh, advisory committee that helps us select journals, and we have 5,600 journals that we index every year. PubMed Central, the circle on your, your right, excuse me, I've got this backwards. The circle on your right is, uh, is our commitment to open access and open science. Starting over 10 years ago, we developed a repository so that every study reported that was funded by NIH can be accessed through this PubMed Central. It's free and open and can be text mined for people who are looking for, for new discoveries as well as read by anyone who chooses to read them. But I'd like to focus in a little bit on now our community health and public health resources, because I know that's what you're most concerned about. We have a, a, a division within the National Library of Medicine called our National Information Center for Health Services Research, NICHSR, we pronounce it. We have public health resources and, and health services resources, including a full range of data sets, databases about specific communities, about clinical and care concerns that are specific to regions, such as our Arctic health environment. This repository is, provides a one-stop shopping to look for information about communities. And if you look at the, the third line down, you say Nick HSR one search. That searches all of our data sets concurrently, so you don't need to search individually for them. This is a resource that we have built in collaboration with the CDC, with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and also, frankly, with a number of, of public community organizations and public health associations. Let me also introduce you within the, the NIC HSR resource to a new set, if I can make this go forward. I'm not advancing, guys. Can you advance for me, please? Um, our health, we have a specific, by legislation, a, a specific focus on collecting health information, health technology, and health data standards. Now, our health data standards resources largely address the individual. So we have terminologies that are useful by hospitals. We have terms that allow us to track infectious disease at a consistent manner. So what's called an outbreak of, of um, a parasite disease in California gets the same name as it does in New Jersey. We're able to build the knowledge this way. We, are, we have a great need to grow standards at the level of communities and the health of communities, how we understand population density, housing adequacy, or the availability of sufficient food. In addition, we are building with the NIH a common data element repository. This is available and accessible for free. It has an enumeration of instruments, mostly social science instruments, that address what we consider the basic social and behavioral domains of an individual. We are trying to support consistency in the assessment. Frankly, these instruments are driven by research of the last 20 years, which we know has not been as inclusive as it needs to be. So we welcome your input not only to use these tools, but to tell us what's missing, to help us know what might be more appropriate or more reasonable for the communities you work with. We have through our specialized information services an ability to address the special concerns of communities. And we started off many years ago now, back in the 70s, with toxicology and environmental health, in part because this, these concerns disproportionately affect minority populations around the country. So our ToxNet and our toxicology and environmental health program organizes and provides information on databases that deal with everything from water quality to pollutants in a river to the ability or the understanding of what's under your kitchen sink at home. 
this is a, a tool that is designed to help ensure the individuals have information at their hands, as well as the industry has information at their hands, to ensure the safe care of workers. Our toxicology resources are used for data safety monitoring tools around the world in laboratories and hazardous employment environments. Um, our specialized information services, which is a different division of the National Library of Medicine, focuses on outreach to special populations. This resource provides quality information and builds capacity in communities to understand and find ways how to use that information. I want to call your attention to three of the programs that are listed on that list at the bottom of the page. First, we have the, the Health Reach. Health Reach is a multilingual resource for health information, both nationally as well as locally. It's designed for immigrants new to this country to be able to find information in their own language and to understand some of the manner in which health care is delivered and accessed in this country. Second, I want to point out the Environmental Health Information Partnership. The Environmental Health Information Partnership is a partnership with over 24 schools, colleges, and community groups that specifically address the, the capacity building for science, technology, and, and, um, and service by using environmental health as their organizing framework. This group began because of the disproportionate dumping of toxic materials in some rural communities, recognizing that there was a need for local colleges to begin to help not only to monitor this, but also to build a workforce for assisting in this. This group continues to meet. I met with them just again last week. One of their goals this year is to work on a transition program to build skills in incarcerated persons transitioning to the community, giving them specific skills in environmental health, environmental health monitoring, and environmental health assessment. The last line, American Indian Health and Arctic Health, is a special collaboration we have with the University of Alaska. Here we're trying to understand how the changes in the environment are affecting the health of both the ecosystem as well as the individuals in that community. And again, by using our resources, we have the ability to galvanize a community to provide information at the point of need and to make the information accessible at that level of a community. We do also spend some of our effort in preserving the past. You saw in that beautiful video the lovely image of that young child as he watched the video that captured the native healers speaking in their own tongue of the traditions of healing around the country. Our native voices is one multi-year investment in ensuring that the knowledge of some minority communities is preserved, even if it's not accessible in the standard communication and clinical information ways that we're used to seeing in articles and books. Now I'd like to take a couple minutes to prepare for the future, and I want you to get ready because the homework assignment is coming up soon. The first thing I want to remind you is that we're preparing for the future, not by expecting you to join us in Washington, but by putting the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. As I indicated before, this program, which is now 30 years strong, has eight regions of the country and 6,500 members. Our National Network of Libraries of Medicine is designed to work with public libraries, hospital libraries, and academic health science libraries to provide resources in the community. Now, some of those resources are access to the information that we have at the National Library of Medicine, but some of it will increasingly help us drive towards data-driven discovery. And I understand the fu one of the fundamental questions at this meeting is to discuss how does data intersect with the health of a community? Let me show you a brief video that shows you what the National Library of Medicine envisions as the data-driven discovery of the future.
Now, we're not going to abandon classic experimental and survey studies as a way of understanding the world, but all of the data that are generated through our studies are now being repurposed and made available for future inquiry. This allows for efficiency and also some better understanding, better characterization of the context of the person and the environment where they live. So let me, sum, let me finish by giving you your assignments here to think about the data relevant to communities. How do we discover communities through data? We're certainly familiar with community surveys and public and governmental reports. Increasingly, we have sensor networks which are assessing everything from air quality, noise and light patterns to pedestrian behavior. That information can help us understand how a community is behaving. Satellite pictures that let us look at the clustering of cars around a hospital might indicate an increase in the flu experience in that community. Quick analysis of the way products are purchased in a grocery store might help us understand whether or not there's an influenza outbreak in a community. We're poised to understand more, but we lack the perspective of the various communities who don't fall under the majority consideration of what is community, who fall outside of our traditional healthcare delivery systems. Your assignment today is to send me one, just one, only one data element that you believe is important to understanding the health of the community you work with. You can reach me in a number of different ways. I am very active on Twitter, I have a blog, but there's my email. Send me one data element so we can include, expand the data-driven discovery to include the health of communities. Thanks very much, and thank you, Gary, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have time for questions at the end, but right now I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Wynn, who's the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Community-Based uh, uh, Research and also Director of the University of Illinois Cancer Center of the University of Illinois Hospital and uh, uh, Science uh, uh, System to talk a little bit about um, uh, all of us. Yes, um, thank you, and thank you for having me this morning. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a different talk. I'm gonna keep it within 15 minutes, but the very first thing I have to say is that the truth of the matter is that the future is actually here. We've been waiting for it, but it's unevenly distributed. And that unequal distribution actually has some consequences. This is the one time as we talk about sustainability of our communities that I believed in my heart and soul that our lack of participation and sometimes will actually increase the disparities that we see between groups. And so I'm gonna give a little bit about why I'm so passionate about the, literally the All of Us program in a shorter time. So it'll be a big overview. Now, the reality is I think that what I actually bought hook, line, and sinker into this program when um, President Obama rolled it out was because he saw too that the power of science actually has the ability to have significant impact on all populations, all of us. The reality is that this was one of the few times where we had someone who wanted to come up with a program to do something for the people to benefit as opposed to doing something to them. Now many of us, and again, we have to get it off the table, we might as well talk about why aren't everybody running up to sign up for this sort of program is because we have historically had some issues, as many of you know, let's just call it, I am not going to call it the Tuskegee, I'm gonna call it what it was, which, is, which was the US public health sort of study of 1932, which actually took folks um, in the context of Alabama and we looked at syphilis. Now the reality is all of our IRBs and many of the things have happened subsequently as a result of that. But let it not be known that we have had some dark periods in the context of quote, benefiting some, but not all of us. So my enthusiasm with this program um, is also driven by folks like Eric Dishman, um, as well as Francis Collins. Now, many of you may not know, but Eric Dishman, who's the head of this All of Us program, who's the director, actually personally benefited from precision medicine. In fact, when he was a young man, around 1920, he had a form of renal cell carcinoma that folks were not able to sort of treat. The interesting thing about Eric is that, again, he was privileged enough to have a scientific community, a medical community, and even a political community who helped for the first time by sequencing, figuring out what gene needed to be targeted. And fast forward to now, 2017, he's the head of our precision medicine program. I wanna juxtapose that though in keeping this very real because people who know me 
The reality is I love science, and if loving science is wrong, I do not want to be right. That's for sure. That's for sure. But we have to actually understand the big scope of science. At the same time, DJ Timbuk2, who some of you probably know who are hip hop heads, you know, whether you listen to Common or whether you listen to lots of other people, this was one of the most amazing DJs of his time. He too was a young man. He too actually had renal cell carcinoma, but his outcome was very different. The access to the medical community, the access to the scientists, the access for him was lacking. And so in some very big ways, we have the wonderment of what I think precise and person-based medicine can do, but we have to recognize that it only is a technology and a tool that if you can't access it, won't benefit. So part of my talk will always be not only about the science, but about the social justice aspects of making all technology available to all of us. Now, the big issue is, why am I so excited about this? Because in some ways, we've fallen behind as in the United States uh, from other countries, including um, uh, the UK, for example. They've actually had large cohort studies in which they're figuring out data based on volunteers to figure out what it is that they could do better for their populations and what better medicines they could take seeing all of us. Now, the interesting thing is this is an audacious sort of program to get more than a million volunteers across the United States involved in you know, giving a, li a little bit of their sort of uh, themselves, literally, <laughs> meaning your DNA, so that we can ultimately build a platform so that when we talk about your children and your family and you talk about the medicines that might work for some but not you, we're finally trying to see that in earnest. Now, independent of the administration that's actually in control, this program was meant for all of us, and I intend with every sort of energy in my body to make sure that it gets out to all of us. Now, the other beautiful part about this program is that not only are we going to build, hopefully, one of the largest platforms and, again, be the leaders in the, in the world in the context of understanding how science interacts with the populations to make them healthier, but interestingly enough, this program is also crazy and audacious enough to say that that data also belongs to you as an individual. And if you feel uncomfortable with it, you can take it away. Now, I tell people when they talk about giving up their data, I go, well, well you know, that would be great, except for everybody's giving it up to 23andMe and Ancestry.com. It's the same data. So let's not get it twisted that there's something very special about this All of Us program that when you see the nice, shiny advertisement about Ancestry.com, that they're not doing, okay? So this is about our health, the health and sustainability of our communities for the future. The data will be freely shared, meaning that you will have access to your data. and We're working out how that actually looks. You'll have access to other things. The best part about this, too, is that we also challenge the NIH and others to say this should not only belong in the hands of you know, our elite institutions, but also our HBCUs, and also some of our other schools that are usually not in that canon as we talk about science, that ultimately we can drive this. And the last part that I really like about this is that we're trying to get something called citizen scientists. Now, I know that's like way back to like the 1900s, right? Where you're like tinkering in your shop and everybody's trying. But this concept that we're not as smart as we think we are, we can use a little bit of help, and the best answers ain't always coming from the elite institutions, sometimes they're coming from other places. We're gonna be very robust in that. So this is just a quick thing about um, basically, uh, you know, way, the way we used to do science is a guy like me um, would come up with a hypothesis, and then I would get a cohort of people, then I would study it. We're sort of saying, let's do something different. What if you actually had a million, two million, or more, people already in a platform, what questions could you ask that would be important to those people based on the data? It's a little bit of a different shift in our thinking, but man, I think it has a wonderful sort of potential outcome. Now, again, this is unapologetic that we're about diversity and the types of people we have. In fact, those people who are traditionally not seen, in fact, I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but we're going to at some point talk about big data as social justice and our tools that we use and why don't we see Native American populations because we say, well, their numbers are too small, so it'll mess up our data. We're gonna to have to get over that and figure something different. Geographic, geography will be different, the data types and the health status. 
So a brief overview is that, again, your data will be accessible. We're going to have two methods of collecting. One is called a, a essentially healthcare provider organizations, which are organizations like the Illinois Precision Medicine Consortium, which is made up of Northwestern, University of Chicago, and University of Illinois, and others getting uh, information to people. And we'll have direct volunteers, which, for example, you may be able to give up um, some of your samples at a Walgreens. So we're trying something different here. Now, is it going to work? We're hopeful. But the reality is we know without trying, we will never get there. We do actually have parts of the program, um, you know, our program data, where we're going to be collecting, you know, baseline um, physical, um, you know, uh, physical, um, the physical evaluation. Um, we'll have electronic health records that we're all trying to integrate, pay participant questionnaires. And we're going to be trying something really crazy in the context of really driving this concept of low cost mobile technologies and being able to gather data that might help out communities ultimately in the end. Um, it really is, a, why would you want to participate? The reality is I told someone that right now, the drugs that we create, I'm sure work for some, but I'm not sure for all. And we have examples of that, about where really being precise medicine really matters. I'm gonna to get to that actually, um, uh, that there are these four big uh, categories, these healthcare uh, provider organizations. There's going to be when, you know, once we collect the samples, we'll then deliver it to a central bio, bio bank, which will be in Mayo. Um, we will have folks at Vanderbilt and others that will be looking and helping us to analyze the data. Um, and then we have this thing called participant technologies uh, led by Scripps, which will really uh, think about security of your data. For example, um, I told someone that the nice part about, you know, getting your data collected, there's good and bad about it, right? Uh, and in one example is that I had a friend with 23andMe and had some additional data, and, and they found out that, well, their dad wasn't exactly the dad, but that was okay. It all worked out in the end. <laughs> all worked out in the end. <laughs> um, as we start thinking about these data supports, these biobanks, as we start thinking about these uh, PTCs, as we call them, um, as we start thinking about our regional medical centers, such as the one up east with uh, Columbia Cornell and, and others, we are really now being forced to work as a group. But I want to give you one quick example of why, oh, which is the most important thing. We're also trying to literally take this to the street. So we are not leaving out the federally qualified health centers where we know where the, that's where the action is. So, you know, they always sort of said, you know, I think Willie Sutton, when he robbed the bank, why, why did he rob the bank? He was like, that's where the money is. Frequently, our big science is not where the money is. And in fact, I'll give you one quick example with sarcoidosis in the United States. We know that sarcoid tends to happen in African-American, particularly African-American women. But if you look at 95% of the studies, less than 5% of that actually represents any African-Americans in those studies. And the median income, just for fun, we looked at all the studies over a period of 15 years, the median income was over $120,000. So again, big science is wonderful and makes me really excited. But if the big science aren't reaching our populations, then it's doing some, but not a lot for all of us. So this big event, but why does it matter? So I want to give you this fun thing, and I think I'll be ending in a couple minutes. Um, we know there's an example of, of Ambien, right? And everybody loved Ambien when it came out. You want to fall asleep, give you Ambien. This is why person-based precise medicine matters. Because we know that if you happen to be a woman, that the doses of Ambien that we were giving out did not work for you. The way that the drug was being processed and metabolized was different. And in fact, by giving you the doses, we were doing you harm, but not good. So while we were giving the standard of care, we weren't really seeing you as a person and giving precise base medicine. Another example of that is Lipitor, which is one of my favorites because I get, as a young resident, when I was working and we first came up with Lipitor, we were so happy we almost gave Lipitor out to everybody. Now, the truth of the matter is, Lipitor really worked for a lot of people, except for if you happen to be Asian. And in fact, you got all the, the unfortunate side effects, but very little of the benefit because it turns out the dose was too high. So again, we are comfort with our basic medicine, our leading edge, but the reality is we are now in an era where we are being forced to see you as an individual and you as a community. And while it's going to be complicated and complex, because the more we actually put these you know, um, little different um, issues on, the more our scientists go, well, what now, right? 
but I think it's the best. Now, why does geography matter? I'm going to give you a quick story, and I'll end really, I mean, really I am. We talked about zip code and genetic code earlier, but let me give you an example. We talked about race, you know, we talked about gender, but let's just talk about does it even make a difference if you're two sisters who grew up in the same town, you grew up in the same home, you grew up under the same circumstances, and then ultimately, as all sisters do and all people do, they move. In this case, one of the sisters moves to one of the most affluent areas of Chicago called the Gold Coast, and that was for a reason, for sure. Wish I could be there, <laughs> maybe one of these days, right? But in that Gold Coast, you have gyms, you have parks, you have the lakefront, you have fresh foods, you have access and an abundance of everything. You have top universities in healthcare, and in fact, they have a life expectancy of 84 which rivals that of Japan and the UK. Second sister moves to a place called Molina. The life expectancy there is somewhere in the neighborhood of barely 70. It's a high poverty rate, crime, violence, high incidences of cancer, certainly a lack of fresh foods. In fact, I was just in Molina uh, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. And there aren't the access to foods uh, or to top universities. The interesting thing is, I answer you the question, again, thinking about this from precision, person-based medicine. They both develop breast cancer. Will the treatment be the same? Now, we think about genetics and we sort of say, well, of course, they're sisters. But this is the old way of thinking, that of course it was going to be the same. But we know two things are different. First, we know that there's something called the microbiome. And we know that the food that you eat, the very food that you have access to, actually modifies the good genes and the bad genes in ways that could actually put you at increased risk right, or improve your health. That's real talk. The second thing is we know that everyday stresses and violence and trauma and these things also have something called an epigenetic effect. Now, when you talk about epigenetics, that is, something on top of your genetics that not only affect you and put you maybe at risk, but also generations that come after you, your children. Where certain genes that might be of benefits are certainly silenced. So the era of just sort of saying, take two aspirins and call me in the morning for everybody is gone by the way of the dodo bird. And that is, it should be gone. It will be a struggle in the future, um, but I will tell you that I think it's something that we, when we roll up our sleeves, we can all do. I show you this house just to tell you that all of our technologies still remind me of my patient who comes from this house, who I asked, how the hell did you live there? And he said, well, you know, there are days where I just had to figure out how to make it. We had fires, and, and I said, that's not right. So when he actually had his 40-pound weight loss, at some point, I had to stop my team from doing a cancer workup and just simply ask, where do you get food? Now, the reality is where we live, the zip code, certainly will actually play a role in the future. And that's data, too, that we should know. But certainly your genetic code, which may be only 20% of what we have to do, also is important. It is all important, and it's all important for all, literally, of us. So I think that I'm going to stop there. We'll do a little um, Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, right now, I want to have a little conversation with um, Ted Love, who is, uh, not Ted Love, who is the CEO of Global Blood Therapeutics, and we're excited to have him here with us. So I, I think I, I want to start the conversation by asking uh, Dr. Love to tell us a little bit about himself um, and, uh, and the work that, that, that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I want to start by thanking all of you for being here and the panelists and all of us for what we're all doing. This is a very exciting conference. There's a lot of stuff here going on that I didn't know that was going on, but it's vital in us creating the kind of ecosystem and the advances and innovations here that you described in your introduction. Um, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about my background, not because it's particularly enlightening, uh, but mainly because I think it is 
reflective of how my journey has progressed in life. And I'll start out by saying I think I'm one of the luckiest people uh, to ever uh, live on this planet. Um, I was born in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, very poor family. My mother and father had uh, fourth and sixth grade educations. Uh, there were eight kids, two parents. Uh, our house wasn't as big as that house that you just showed. Um, uh, so we were definitely a group uh, of people that would have been considered underprivileged. Um, yet, I got to say, I didn't really feel that so much as a kid. I felt like I had loving parents. I had uh, great siblings, brothers that would protect me when people tried to beat me up. Um, it was a great environment. It was a farm, so there was a lot of room to get around and really explore things. But I was born with something that uh, I'm, in retrospect, ex extremely excited about, with a real keen interest in learning and, and an interest in science. And so I did very well in school. The schools were actually segregated back then. Uh, so I went to uh, schools with only black children for the first six years. And I remember when uh, the schools were being integrated, my black teachers came to me and said, you know, you're used to being the top performing student, but next year that's not gonna be the case because the schools are gonna be integrated. And, and indeed, the next year I went to integrated schools. And about halfway through the year I realized I was doing as well as any of the white kids in the class uh, because I think I was curious and I, and I worked hard. Um, to fast forward, uh, I went to high school, uh, also in Huntsville, and I remember when I was getting ready to look at colleges, they would come through and interview us, and I remember particularly, and this is not to call out anyone in particular, uh, but Vanderbilt uh, came through and did a, did a day and I went over to the Vanderbilt table because Vanderbilt was considered the Harvard of the South back then. And um, the recruiter had no interest in talking to me. Um, uh, and I, I wasn't entirely sure why, but coming from my background, I'd seen this kind of thing happen to my parents uh, over the years. And, you know, I put it together. Uh, so I lost interest uh, in Vanderbilt. And I remember spending a lot of time in the library reading about colleges because, you know, I really didn't have a lot of advice from home about where to go to college, and I would just read about the best colleges. And I read about this little place called Haverford College uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and um, I applied to school there. And I applied to a lot of the Ivy Leagues, and uh, in the end, my parents, who were not well-educated, were really smart people. And I remember my mother saying to me, you know, you should look at this little place, Haverford, because it's small, uh, it's going to be a big change for you, so you, need, you ought to think about going to a place where people are really going to connect to you uh, as an individual to help you make the transition that's going to be important. So I went to Haverford. I did fine there. I went to Yale Medical School. I did well there. And then I went on to the Mass General Hospital where I trained in internal medicine and cardiology. I had a lab doing really cool research uh, that was very well funded. Um, and I became bored, you know, I really, and this was very disappointing to me because I thought of myself as becoming a full professor at Harvard Medical School, but I became kind of bored. And fortunately, I had people around me who understood my impatience and my desire to do something different. So I ended up at a company called Genentech that was struggling back then. Um, and um, I just had a, a wonderful career there. I ended up getting promoted to very high levels and in charge of the whole drug development portfolio and got to work on drugs like Herceptin uh, for breast cancer, Rituxan uh, for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, Avastin for a variety of solid tumors, uh, Zolaire for asthma. Uh, I've worked on everything. Um, and after I left there, I got involved with Roy Vangelos, who had retired from Merck, and we started a new company that's now known as Theravance, and then ultimately um, I became CEO with a guy by the name of George Rathman, who was the first CEO of Amgen, and we turned a little company around that was in trouble, turned it into a billion-dollar company, and um, the company actually ran into some trouble down the way, and we merged it, and I retired. I really felt like boy, I've had a good career and I'm tired and I've ignored my family a lot, so I'm gonna retire. Um, 
a friend of mine named Tony Coles uh, had taken a job at a company called Onyx, and Tony acquired a product, actually acquired a company, and he was over at my house uh, for dinner. I mean, his, the four of us, his wife, my wife, uh, and, and, and me, we were having dinner, and Tony said, you know, my friends keep telling me that you ought to get your buddy to come into retirement to help you get this drug approved. And uh, just an aside, my mentor at Harvard and my mother both died of multiple myeloma, and they were working on a multiple myeloma drug. So, and Tony had been a great friend over my life. So I said, I'll come out of retirement to, uh, uh, to help you with this company. And you know, amazingly, we actually got the drug approved, even though the drug had been developed in a way that was um, a very controversial. We got the drug approved, and it's on the market, and I think it's one of the best drugs uh, for treating multiple myeloma. So that's a little bit of my background. I know it's rambling, but uh, <laughs> no, uh, that gives you some context about the journey. No, that's, a, that's an incredible journey. Um, um, yeah, that's all I can say. That's an incredible journey. So, so you, you retired once, and, and you come out of retirement again. So um, the journey continues, and now you're doing uh, global blood therapy. So talk a little bit why you came out of, out of retirement again. So if nothing else, it proves that I'm incompetent at retirement, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but um, I really was committed to retirement this time. I remember I'd done this thing with Tony, and I said, I'm not going to do this again. So my wife and I actually sold our house uh, that was near San Francisco. We bought a house in the wine country. Uh, I was up there working on my golf handicap, and it actually made quite a lot of progress. And um, uh, one of my friends, actually, that I had known at Harvard, uh, who had a lab contiguous uh, with mine, uh, Charles Holmes, he called me up and said, Ted, um, we're starting a company. And since the day we started this company, we thought you were the CEO, and I want to talk to you about it. So he told me a bit about the company, and uh, the company was focused on sickle cell disease which, as you all know, is a disease in the United States that primarily affects African Americans. So that was very interesting to me intellectually, but I just couldn't do it. So I ultimately told them, I, I just can't work full time again, uh, but I'll take a seat on the board. And I took a seat on the board, and I watched the science, scientists and uh, the team in the company make more and more progress. And every board meeting, they'd ask me, would you run the company? <laughs> So after about a year, I finally said, I've got to do it. Um, and I'll tell you why I, I finally decided that. Um, I saw this drug effectively curing mice that we had engineered to have sickle cell disease. And I had another board meeting in Seattle right after this board meeting where we had been presented this data from the mice. And I couldn't get running GPT off my mind. So when I landed, I called my wife up and I said, um, honey, um, I want to tell you what's on my mind. And I talked to her about it. <laughs> and she said, look, you know, come home. We'll all talk about it as a family. So we have two lovely daughters. And we all sat down. And I just said, you know, I know that I kind of promised the rest of my life and time to you guys. <laughs> but uh, the opportunity to actually be involved in maybe something that could be a an effective cure for sickle cell disease, you know, it's hard for me to walk away from because I used to treat these patients when I was at Yale and when I was at the Mass General, and the care was poor because in part we really didn't have good medicines, and the, the care was also poor because they were largely poor, they were frequently poor and uneducated people, and they were almost always people of dark skin. And the healthcare system really didn't treat them properly. And I knew it. I think we all knew it. And I said, boy, it is a social justice issue for me to get involved with this and to try to lead this company. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. Um, I would take a minute, if you guys don't mind, to if you could indulge me, to talk about sickle cell disease and about um, the science of sickle cell disease because it's actually fascinating. Sickle cell disease is a defect that's called by a single mutation on a single protein. It's a monogenetic disease. It was, in fact, the first disease that was described as a monogenetic disease. Linus Pauling, in 1959, uh, did a hemoglobin electrophoresis, and he proved that people with sickle cell disease have a hemoglobin that moves a little differently because of this one mutation. The first patient in America 
that was recognized to have sickle cell disease was seen in 1911 uh, in Chicago uh, as a dental student. Um, um, yet today, uh, even though HIV was a disease of the 80s, we've got 29 drugs to treat children with HIV. Yet this disease was recognized in 1911. We have zero drugs in this country approved to treat sickle cell disease. It's a monogenetic disease. Um, and let me tell you, it isn't that complicated. At least I don't think it's that complicated in retrospect. Um, I'm gonna, our bodies, all of us, we have an enormous need for oxygen. I mean, it's beyond what you can imagine. And I'll give you a couple of, couple of facts to put this into context. About two pounds of our body, two pounds, is hemoglobin. We have a lot of hemoglobin, and all that hemoglobin is in our blood and it's inside of red cells. Now, why were we made with so much hemoglobin? Um, I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, because we need so much oxygen. The other thing is that we have lungs that exchange air and give oxygen. If you were to spread out the alveoli, which is the small part of the lungs that actually do oxygen, our alveoli surfacers would be the size of a tennis court. So you've got a tennis court and two pounds of hemoglobin to get you the oxygen. So people with sickle cell disease have a mutation in that hemoglobin, and there's a lot of it in their body. And when that goes wrong, it creates terrible problems in their red cells. And to put it into context, hemoglobin should be like sugar. It should be soluble in water. But people with sickle cell disease, because of this mutation, when the hemoglobin deoxygenates, it becomes like sugar that's insoluble. And in fact, it now organizes in the red blood cells like water inside of a balloon, and it forms rods, and it rips the balloon open, and it deforms it. That's why the cells are sickled, because they've got these rods inside. So our company, knowing this, said, we know that people with sickle cell disease don't get sick when they're very young, and that's because they have this thing called fetal hemoglobin that we had in utero that we stop making after we're born. And the reason kids don't get sick initially is that we have primarily fetal hemoglobin. And as that adult hemoglobin, in their case, sickle hemoglobin, becomes the dominant species, in fact, when it becomes about 80% of the hemoglobin, that's when they start to get sick. But they're perfectly protected. So our idea was, could we make a molecule which binds to the hemoglobin, which makes the hemoglobin hold onto the oxygen a bit more tightly, because the hemoglobin, the sickle hemoglobin with an oxygen on it will not polymerize. So maybe we could restore you back to your early state by modifying about 20% of your hemoglobin. I'm really thrilled to say we've now treated somewhere in the order of 60 people with sickle cell disease 100% of the time. 100% of the time they began to revert. Um, so I'm very excited. I love science. I love, and I'm, I'm just thrilled about the journey about uh, trying to direct science to help people uh, that quite frankly have been ignored. It's been kind of a medical desert, if you will, for patients with sickle cell disease, and we are invading the desert. That is just absolutely fabulous work, and we're you know, extraordinarily excited about, about the research, and we've been well aware of the challenges that have been going on in the sickle cell community, so I know everyone is, is really excited. Uh, while, while I have you, I just want, for this audience in particular, it is very rare when we have a CEO of a pharmaceutical company. I'm just putting it out there. There, 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 there there's, there's not a lot of us in, in that space, and we need more, and, 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 and it's a journey. Um, a little bit of advice on, on, on what the business life is like um, and how does one, you know, because you're, you're, you're doing good and you're doing well at the same time. It, it's really extraordinarily important. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm just going to editorialize for two seconds to set, set up the question. Um, one of the things that's really important about our community um, that, that gets lost in the sauce is that it's really 1965 is sort of the date when we begin to come into the marketplace mm -hmm. uh, and, and being able to, to, to uh, create a, a world for ourselves. And the story that you, you talk about in, in Alabama I could, it, it's not an uncommon story about how we've had to, to make that journey and find our place. 
Lots of us have children. I've got a daughter. I would love her to grow up to be a head of a pharmaceutical company if she's out there somewhere <laughs> listening to me, please. <laughs> so if you could talk a little bit about that. I think this audience in particular would, would love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, you know, I'm, I never thought I would ever quote George Bush, um, but, but I'm going to quote George Bush. He said something, uh, um, he said a lot of things I didn't agree with, but uh, one of the things that he said that immediately resonated for me is that you either stand for something or you could fall for anything. And I think that um, a central part in, in, in my life has been that my parents really taught me to stand for something. And uh, you can't stand for everything, you can't accomplish everything, you can't do everything, but you really need to kind of pick your pockets uh, and, and decide what you stand for. So I really have focused on uh, science uh, because I love it. Um, I have focused uh, as a physician on making drugs because when I was a practicing physician, I found that the things that really changed the outcome for my patients were the interventions and the drugs. Uh, and they were a minority, still today, less than 20% of the healthcare cost. Uh, so I finally decided when I was getting bored in my lab that maybe I should get out there and get involved with companies that are actually making drugs that are going to be highly effective in changing people's lives. Um, and that fit with my science. It fit with my real burning desire to do something that would be helpful to a lot of people. And um, it's, it's been fascinating. So I, I would say to, and it's hard. It's hard, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, uh, uh, but I like that, you know, I like challenge. I like things that are hard. I like doing things that everybody else said you can't do it. And I don't go into things like I'm not going to fight, you know, I'm not going to fight Mike Tyson. You know? So if people <laughs> say you can't beat Mike Tyson, I'm like, I agree with you. But if people say, you know, you can't go to Harvard Medical School, or you can't go to Yale Medical School, I am going to say, I'm not sure how you know that. You know, Mike Tyson beating up, I'm pretty sure I understand <laughs> how you figure that out. Uh, but but, but, there, but, but I, I'm unwilling to accept things as true beca uh, in certain situations because <coughs> I grew up, and I think this is really good for, uh, for, for most young people to understand, is that I grew up with a fundamental belief that if anybody had done something, anybody had done something, I might be able to do that too. Provided the right resources, provided the opportunity, why not? If somebody else got a Nobel Prize by working hard and applying themselves, well, maybe I could do that too. And I think enough people don't have that. And to me, it is a fundamental direct relationship to the fact that all of us are created equal. Great. Uh, I see they're setting up the mics. I'm gonna, um, uh, open up the mics in just one second. I uh, um, just wanted to uh, put a question to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Patty. Um, you know, uh, what, what you have said about the, uh, the library is so important. Um, I remember uh, the example uh, you gave about, um, at, at one of the board meetings, about um, how the role that the library played in the HIV um, movement. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about uh, what the library did uh, in, in that whole effort to, to really um, take on the challenge of HIV. I think it's so instructive. Through our specialized information service, we actually have a 25-year history of systematically providing information into the community about managing HIV as an individual, as well as to help our clinicians discover and our scientists d develop new ways of treatment. The important part, though, that Gary's referring to really has to do with the fact that people live with HIV every day. And in order to get information into their hands, it's not enough simply to say, we have a library, come visit us. We had community health workers. We had meetings, if you saw in our video, meetings in, in beauty salons. We had conversations with people about what their fears, their understandings, and their misunderstandings were. So the delivery <coughs> of information 
around the country to people has really required us to think about new ways to get information into people's hands, especially in a process where there was a tremendous uncertainty about the ability to trust the federal government and addressing an issue that had a complex social um, interpretation. One of the things that I'm particularly proud of that the, the, the National Library of Medicine did was to make use of our community engagement. Yes. We recognize that delivering information without a person to help think it through is an enormous challenge, and it's actually, frankly, not worth our, to, to create information resources without having that pathway. And one of the things that I think you need to understand is, as you heard Dr. Wynn's presentation about the All of Us program, that once again we are taking what we learn from the HIV epidemic to partner with Eric Dishman and the All of Us program to make sure that our libraries are ready for someone coming in with this printout of data to say, What's, what do I do with this? How do I understand this? We know our physicians, our nurses, our nurse practitioners, our community workers are desiring to help them, but we also know they are so under-resourced and there is not enough time in any clinical encounter to walk through the information and yet as the All of Us program promises, each participant will be able to see his or her own information and will need new kinds of resources that will help in interpreting and understanding and we learned about how to do that through the HIV process. Great. Uh, if there are questions, there, I think there's some mics up. If you'll start to come up, if you've got any questions in the interim, I want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Wynn a, a question or, or a thought, really. Um, the All of Us campaign is, is, is an absolutely important campaign, and I hope everyone in the room um, uh, you know, gets, gets that message and, and, and helps in community in terms of encouraging people to be part of it. One of the things that, that um, it, it may be going on already that, that we certainly like to see is we we want to make sure that minority serving providers, um, uh, education institutions have access to that data um, and that there are programs being put together so that we make sure that, because um, uh, I, think, I think this is really important, um, that we're building infrastructure in those communities around research, around uh, investigation, and that's going to be a tremendous resource. And so I hope that's part of yeah, thing. I, I, in fact, that's one of the largest part. Um, I think back in the day, my, my grandfather used to actually tell me, he said, listen, if you are not at the table, he would remind me, then you are on the menu. His ah. words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Life lesson. <laughs> um, so in that context, we have been absolutely um, adamant about having the first voice and the continued voice and the last voice with the community. And so um, Eric and all of us have been very adamant about getting um, the community. And not just community people who are just, you just sort of see, but also the voices that you typically don't get to hear from. Because sometimes you get very real answers because they have no skin in the game. The thing that I've actually been most driven by, and I remind most communities, that the interesting thing about ACT UP, and I don't know if people remember ACT UP, but you may remember what they did, but the name itself was like hot. It was the AIDS coalition to unleash power, right? And in fact, there was a belief that folks who actually were suffering with HIV AIDS had that sort of agency to unleash power, to make demands. And yet when I go on 63rd and King on the south side of town in Chicago, most people aren't unleashing anything. And their, their demands about what the system <clears throat> what science, what medicine, what other things and issues can bring to them. Because they feel, as I've actually had a couple town hall meetings, well, that goes for, as one person told me, which was a young man said, well, that's rich people stuff. <laughs> and as soon as I heard that, I actually knew what I actually had to do. Because it's not rich people stuff, it's all of us, and it belongs to all of us. And in fact, one of the things that I'm hoping is that we get not only Eric Dishman and folks at the NIH and National Library, we are trying to reach out, but to unleash a sense of awareness and a sense of power that belongs to our communities, to get them re-engaged, to get them re-engaged in things of, I dare say, civic responsibility. I know that's a crazy word to use. But in times where you disagree and you agree, you ultimately have to be involved, and that's what we're trying to actually reignite 
in all our communities that this belongs to them as well. So to your, to your question, we are uh, hell-bent on making that happen. Good. Uh, thank you, Gary, and certainly thank you all. I'm Paul Underwood from Phoenix, Arizona. This is a question for you, Ted, and certainly you've had um, uh, as a very, very background coming up from humble undertakings where you may have faced barriers to getting health care, then as a practitioner, academic, and now in the pharmaceutical industry. And certainly you've had a, a broad chance to see a lot of how medicine is being made. And so how, how do you have the balance between, say, um, developing medicines and then selling medicines. I mean, oftentimes people think that people have illness and that uh, pharmaceutical and device companies take advantage of them, where in fact you actually make tremendous investments to try to help overcome illnesses. I mean, certainly your most recent experience has been one that's near and dear to all of us in terms of sickle cell anemia, and this seems to be a personal passion since you brought you out of two retirements to actually get engaged with it. So it's not likely all about economics, but there is some degree of passion that takes place as well from the boardroom to try to help enhance the individual's um, lives. How, how do you see that balance in your leadership in terms of how to steer companies to success while they make that transition? That, that, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think I'll go back to what do you stand for? Uh, so I came into this career as a physician. I really came into this career with a focus on the patient. And as a CEO, you really have a lot of people that you are trying to be loyal to. Yes. Uh, and, but I can tell you yes. that my view anyway is that if you are not putting the patient first, you're going to get lost. Uh, because our business should <coughs> be about, number one, helping the patient. Now, I've got employees that I have to care about, and I've got investors that I have to care about. Uh, and there are communities that are surrounding our patients that I need to care about. And I care about all of those, uh, and I have to make all of those work. Otherwise, this thing doesn't work. Um, but, but, but we start uh, and focus every day on the patient. Uh, and I think that's really the central way for us to keep it all together. When I talk to investors that are giving us the money to develop our drugs, they know that I'm focusing on the patient. When I, when I talk to our employees, and I'm trying to get more hours out of them, and I'm trying to get more, de <laughs> more dedication out of them, they know that we're doing it uh, for the patient. When we go out and we deal with uh, the communities, we, we really want them to understand that we care as desperately as they care about their family member with sickle cell disease and making the whole ecosystem of what needs to change work. And we have a part of that, and we, but, but, but we only have a part of it. But we're very excited about engaging with the whole community uh, to make it all work. We're, we're trying to make a drug, uh, but that drug is not going to be effective without the other elements that many of you are going to have to bring to the table, and I know you will. My name is Ahmed Elmi. I, uh, I am with uh, HCM Strategist working on NIH Precision Medicine, uh, all of us research program. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, is engage all the community, community partners as well as the researchers and, and, and healthcare providers. And so what I wanted to know is that, you know, the library, National Library of Medicine, for example, and your research projects and your pharmaceutical companies, and many of you who are here, to, how can we work together to make sure that, that this, all of us research program is done right so it doesn't increase disparities but reduces disparities or eliminates that? I'll take my answer. Well, uh, <laughs> um, it, the, the NIH has a history of great successes and unfortunately has some history of great failures. And, and I will tell you what I, would, I have learned. I've been at NIH eight months. I've been an NIH-funded researcher for 30 years. I will tell you the, 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 the challenge of, of communication and coordination increases, not decreases over time. And having the ability to have input into decisions that are uh, large and, and enterprise-wide, which the All of Us program is, 
um, uh, requires poking at a number of different places. So I would suggest three points of an intersection. First and foremost, there is a council of councils that drives the NIH policy level and, and, and providing information to those councils, providing an email to the chair of that council, providing an assessment and feedback to those councils is, is the best pathway into the NIH uh, in policy level. Secondly, there are often requests for information or RFIs that are published in the Federal Register that ask for input. Now, they tend to be written in ways that I wouldn't consider sound as interesting as a party invitation. So you have to plow through and figure out what is being asked here. But in the last six months, we've asked about data sharing. We've asked about policies for labeling information. We've asked about uh, strategies for essentially investing in data repositories for the future. And we tend to hear from scientist to scientist. That's helpful, but it's not enough. So I would say to, to respond to requests for information, working through the public policy arm of the associations you're involved with, highlighting to them the need to keep a watch for certain um, themes that are coming out or have a regular search or work with the NIH and the, and the, uh, the Federal Register notification system is important. So first is talk to the Council on Councils. Second is to uh, find a way to ensure that the voice is heard across the country of how these different policies that NIH is addressing might affect a particular community. Don't worry if you don't know everything about the science. If you read something and it resonates with where your policy or where your community is going, respond to that. And the third part, I would say um, importantly, is to monitor our uh, public discussion. So monitor the All of Us website to, to <coughs> see how the, the, the program is unfolding, because it is unfolding rather quickly. The first people will be enrolled in the program by late fall, right? Late fall. And, um, we have, and there's, there are points for, for, for engagement, but I will tell you that at this point, the teams are, are unfortunately hit by the federal freeze, so they're smaller than they need to be, they're working harder than they, than they can, and so it's more of a burden of pulling information to you than pushing information back to them at the level of the All of Us program right now. All right, we're gonna take this last question. Anita Noble from Portland, Oregon. I'm representing uh, Molly's Fund Fighting Lupus and Lupus Research Alliance out of New York. Uh, Ted, you mentioned patients, and my passion is with patient advocacy. And when I'm seeing, a, and I have lupus, I've had lupus for over 20 years. When I'm with my rheumatologist or pulmonologist, I want a relationship in which it's with them and it's with me. And I've seen what you talked about because I'll go to appointments with other lupus patients and I watch the staff dismiss them and not even hear what they're saying. I'm a firm believer that that physician works for us. And I don't have a problem interviewing a physician before I make them my specialist. Do you have any advice or tips and particularly out in Oregon, I, I personally feel that people of color are still invisible. It is so hard to get on the radar in Portland, Oregon. So what advice would you have for those of us who are advocates for patients? Well, I, I think that, yeah, I think you're doing the right things. Um, now, I, I, I was told a story recently about a young sickle cell kid that was at school and suffered a stroke, which is not uncommon for sickle cell kids. Yet in this school, uh, there was absolute ignorance of sickle cell disease. There was absolute misunderstanding of what this kid had. And they actually put him in a car and sent him home because thought he was a malinger. They didn't understand what he had. That would not happen to your kid. That would not happen to my kid. That shouldn't happen to any kid. The reason it wouldn't happen to your kid is because you're going to talk to the people. You're going to let them know what's going on. You're going to tell them in advance. And they are going to have a healthy dose of respect for you because you're going to demand it. That's right. And I think that's not happening as much as it should. In reality, and you know, Bill, I think you said it. I mean, you know, the reality is everybody should be given respect straight away. 
That's where I was taught, but not everybody was raised that way. And unfortunately, some of us are going to have to demand the respect and the attention. That's why I love the patient advocates. I love uh, this whole process that we've been a part of to try to get things right. One of my physicians early on in medical school said, if you want to know what's going on with your patient, you should have to talk to them. And that sounds really simple, but we often don't talk to people when we want to understand what's going on. We've made some good progress in sickle cell disease. In part, I want to give a shout out to the FDA. The FDA, about two years ago, invited in a bunch of sickle cell patients. And they started out this meeting by saying, we know that there's sickle cell patients, patient advocates, uh, and doctors in the audience, and we want to tell the doctors, we don't want to hear from you. We're glad you're here, but we want to hear from the patients in the community. The first thing they said is, we don't care about vaso-occlusive crisis. That's all the doctors care about. All the studies to develop drugs focus on vaso-occlusive crisis. And look how far we've gotten with this huge focus on vaso-occlusive crisis. To the FDA's credit, eight months later, they held another meeting with industry, and I was invited to that meeting. And at that meeting, the FDA pretty much spoon-fed us to think about using what is now called patient-reported outcomes. And this is going to be important in lupus, for sure, where you actually have devices that collect how the patient is filtered, uh, filling in an unfiltered way. There's no healthcare intervention. You give the patient the device, they take your medicine or placebo, and they, on a daily basis, tell you how they're doing. Now, even though the FDA pretty much spoon-fed us that that's the right thing to do, when we left that meeting, to my knowledge, only one company, one company in this whole great United States got excited about patient reported outcomes. We got excited about it. Over the next year, we spent about a million dollars, and it took us about a year of interacting with the patient advocacy community, patients, healthcare providers, and the Food and Drug Administration, and we developed a patient reported outcome, which is simple, nine questions, four answers, and we're doing this 400 patient worldwide study now, where we are going to figure out whether or not this drug is beneficial to the patient based upon what they are saying is happening with them, unfiltered, unfettered by what a physician would say or anyone else. And this came about by us talking to people, by us asking you know, your counterparts in sickle cell disease, how do, we, how do we understand this and how do we really make sure that what we're doing is really providing the solutions that the patient wants. And with lupus, because you have a lupus flare, I've worked hard with my relationships with my physicians. So when I show up in the ER, my pulmonologist has instructed that ER, I want to be called when Anita shows up. But we gonna have and, to even, I, I, I was going to say, we're going to even have to take that one step further. And, and the one step further is something that we've been talking around the issue about it being nice. But let me just tell you, there are other pressures that are coming on with technology that's going to actually mandate that communities be much more involved Good. and that patient advocates play a much more <laughs> significant role. Good. The open table sort of concept about how you get a restaurant, right around the corner is this open table sort of concept of how you get a physician. Now, that's all cool because, you know, for some of the low things and the immediate things I got, I got a sore throat as a strep or not, that's going to work. But for some of the more in chronic things or the more significant things like lupus, like diabetes and the consequence of what that's actually doing, right? Like all these other things. That's actually going to take a different kind of strategy. Now, the interesting thing is while I've talked high tech all morning long, we also have to think about low tech. And what I mean by that is I've looked literally at low and middle income communities and said, well, here's the life expectancy in the United States. Right. Give me an example of the best low middle income or, or low to middle income type communities and whether they reach that mark in the United States of our life expectancy. Right. Couldn't find it. In fact, I got things only three miles apart, four miles apart actually, in Chicago where I have one, Garfield Park, 68 is the life expectancy. 84, right down the street, is that in the Gold Coast? And we say that that's okay. 
So the truth of the matter is we have to get re-engaged, almost like not to quote, you know, James Brown and Bobby right. Byrne, right. but right. there is a time where the communities don't all have to get up, right. get involved, right. and get into it. Right. Because there has to be now an element of accountability right. that just says, no, right. we're not just going to do whatever. And yes, we deserve this. And in fact, it's going to be more than just putting some dock in the boxes right. in those communities, too. There's going to have to be real attention to social determinants of health, real attention to the community and the health of that community. Because otherwise, we're just playing around the corner as opposed to getting up in the sandbox and doing what we need to do. And so, it starts with us because as parents... As I'm a 64-year-old parent, and I moved around the United States a lot. Every time we moved to a city, my husband and I took our three kids and said, this is Stephen, Jay, and Stephanie. We are James and Anita. They belong to us. They're here for these X amount of hours. Here's our phone number. Give us a call, whatever. You have to do it. Absolutely. And I'm proud to say that the oldest is just returned from Kandahar, Afghanistan, where he was a cardiac thoracic surgeon but went to an HBCU. That's right. That's right. But you know what? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but, we, but we also have to be aware of Tawanda, who's, kid, who's you know, 15, 16, and actually on her own, right? And right on 63rd and King, too. And the fact that she can't find her voice, don't know that she has a voice. So we have to be uh, aware of what we have and the agency of those in our communities that don't have those voices. And we're and that's building why that together. With the other patients. That's right. That's right. That's right. I, um, I have the unfortunate assignment to say uh, I want to thank our speakers and presenters. Um, I, I, I love the energy. Um, I could sit. Uh, I think um, uh, I'm looking forward to this conference. And I want to thank our presenters for getting us off on a, on a great first step. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.